Hey, hey, it's Shay Keister, and I'm your host and the founder of Casual Cattle Conversations, a global rancher education company that strives to bring honest thoughts and conversations from ranchers and leaders to other ranchers. Be sure to follow Cattle Convos on social media to have more in-depth conversations around the ranching business and lifestyle brought to you. If you are ready to take your operation to the next level and improve your lifestyle too, send me a message about my Rancher Mind group. Rancher Minds are monthly roundtable discussions for ranchers to learn from peers and experts and leave the call with actionable advice to make changes on their own operations. With that, let's see who our guest is today and what experience and advice they have to offer you to improve your own operation. All right, Lydia. Well, thank you for joining me on the show today. It's great to meet you, not over Instagram, but I really wish this was not the circumstance we were talking about, but we will dive into the New Mexico fires a little later. But just to give my audience an idea of who you are, and um, even I'm curious about your background a little bit, would you just talk about your background in ranching and your current operation now? Absolutely. And thank you so much for having me. Um, My name is Lydia Kyle. I am a fourth generation cattle rancher. I was originally raised in the Great Basin of the West, um, Southern Oregon, very Northern New Mexico, or very Northern California. Um, I'm now in Northern New Mexico. Um, But uh, I was fourth generation. Our family historically uh, cattle ranched, um, cow-calf operations. And then I went off to college and really didn't plan on coming back to agriculture, but I met my husband who is a ranch manager by trade and by education. And we moved back to the family ranch. Uh, We were there for several years, but then decided to go off and kind of do our own thing. And that's how we ended up in Northern New Mexico. And so we manage a uh, cow-calf operation here, way up in the mountains of Northern New Mexico. All right. So it's you and your husband and your whole family. Um, as we can kind of see the car seats in the background of your car today. <laughs> so with that, you know, you really reached out about to me about wanting to talk about the New Mexico fires and how they weren't really be, being adequately covered in the media. So would you kind of talk about when those fires in New Mexico started and kind of the storyline of how they've progressed? Yes. And essentially, you know, what I'm trying to do is we've been evacuated. We're still currently displaced. Um, Mandatory evacuations have been lifted, but it burned all the power lines supplying power to our main headquarters, our shops, our shipping pens and our house. So we're still displaced for the foreseeable future. But I realized, you know, when I was coming up for air, Um, You know, I have a fairly large um, social media following and I started to ask questions of like, have you guys heard about what's happening in New Mexico other than the fact that like my family evacuated and you follow me on social media? And it was astounding to me the amount of people, 80 percent of the people that I essentially polled regarding this had had no idea what was happening um, outside of the fact that my family was evacuated from a wildfire. Um, And so essentially, I was just kind of like, you know what, it's obvious that the mainstream media, this was a blip on the radar, it was covered by Good Morning America and those types of things. But a lot of people aren't trusting mainstream media anymore. And they're choosing to get their news from more independent sources. And I just realized, like, you know, we need to get this out to the independent sources. And y'all have done an amazing job. I have been on no less than, you know, five podcasts in the past three days. Um, It's incredible uh, the way that news media is reaching out from the independent sources. But essentially what's happening in New Mexico right now, because it is still happening, on April 6th, so April 6th, we're, I mean, shoot, we're going on almost eight weeks of this nonsense. It's just wild to me. Um, It feels like, it, it feels like it's never going to end. But on April 6th, um, the Forest Service lit the Las Dispensas controlled burn. And that controlled burn was lit in the morning, was my understanding, or or mid-morning. And by 4 p.m., it was classified as a wildfire. And it was renamed the Hermit's Peak Fire. Again, all the way back in April 6th. Uh, I remembered seeing that prescribed burn out my front window. 
I texted a neighbor. I said, hey, do you know what that is? And she said, oh, it's a prescribed burn. And I remember thinking to myself, what a terrible day to do a prescribed burn. New Mexico is in a historic drought. Um, New, Northern New Mexico individually is in a historic drought. And April is our windiest month of the year. Anybody who has been in the Southwest can tell you how hard the wind can blow here. Like 25 miles an hour is a light breeze in April. We had 40 mile an hour winds that day. And someone gave it the green stamp of approval to go ahead and light a prescribed burn. So by 4 p.m. that day, we had a wildfire and that was the first fire. That went on for several weeks. However, it was blowing away from the property that we managed. So we were kind of watching it, but it wasn't directly impacting us. It was directly impacting our community and we were having to you know, help where help was needed, but not us in particular. And then on April 19th, a second fire was started. The cause of that fire is under investigation. I am willing to guess that it was an ember from the original fire. Again, that's purely speculation on my end. However, that makes the most sense. Um, so that was April 19th, and that fire was called the Calf Canyon Fire. Those fires eventually converged on each other because they were very close to each other, and they became the Hermit Peaks, uh, Hermit's Peak Complex Fire. And that's the fire that is currently burning right now. On April 29th, our family was evacuated due to a shift in the wind and it blew down directly on top of the ranch that we managed. We uh, stood in our yard that night and we watched flames come over the peak of the mountain range that we kind of butt up against. And we were seeing 200, 300 foot flames, trees exploding on the, on the mountain ridge. Uh, we saw a fire tornado and it was at that point we decided that we were bugging out. Uh, we loaded horses. We had about 25 head of horses on the ranch. We loaded them up, loaded the bare minimum essentials and family heirlooms, loaded the kids up, and we have not been home since. Wow. So have have you been able to see any footage of if you have anything left? Or are you still waiting to go back and see? Yeah. When I say we haven't been back, I mean that we're currently displaced. We are able to go back to the ranch. My husband, we chose not to evacuate our cattle simply because we we understood the topography of the property and we made a choice. We understood that it was the timber that was fueling this and we gave our cattle access to the largest open areas that we could so that they could get away from the timber lines. That proved to be a good choice. The fire did burn onto the ranch. It burned a lot of our timber. It burned a lot of our northern side. Um, but when it hit those grazed acres and it hit that forage, essentially, timber versus forage, it really slowed down. And so we never had to evacuate the cattle. However, my husband had to go back and feed them um, because the interesting thing to me is a lot of people ask, you know, well, what are you going to do for summer feed? We were mentally preparing for a drought year anyway. And drought year means that you're supplementing cattle regardless. Now we just have drought year on top of burned pastures. <laughs> and um, so it, it really doesn't change the projected uh, plan for the summer months. We don't have forage because we're in a drought. And that's just where we're at in New Mexico, regardless of a wildfire. The wildfire is just... Um, it's more than an inconvenience. It's just a product of poor forest management and bad timing. Well, so with that, how have uh, the communities impacted by this, other ranchers, other livestock producers, how are they coming together? Um, are there groups forming to kind of help take measures of recovery? Is there something other people can do? What is that status like as far as a um, community to take care of things after the pact? So unfortunately, um, you know, today is the 24th of May. That fire is still actively burning. Um, it has burned through where the property that we manage is, um, they've lifted the mandatory evacuations for our area. However, it's still burning on both sides. 
Um, and we're up to the last number that I heard was about 314,000 acres. This is the largest fire in New Mexico state history. And the last I heard it is only 40% contained. So it's really hard to say, well, what do we do now? Because it's not over. It is a long ways from over. And, um, you know, the, the ranching communities have come together tremendously. You know, I can speak to what our family experienced. We're actually living on another ranch right now. They had an empty cow camp. They're friends of ours, and they just opened that up to us and all the horses. And that's where we've been for the past month. Um, I know there are a lot of other ranches in the area that are harboring livestock, um, a lot of fair boards, a lot of county fair, uh, you know, locations, fairgrounds have opened up their facilities for displaced livestock. Um, you know, where we ranch, you actually have a lot of um, generational family farms and smaller operations, not necessarily larger operations like what we manage up high in the mountains. Um, but there are a lot of, you know, generational family homes that are just gone. Um, and that's going to require not only a lot of rebuilding, but also a lot of restructuring within the community. Because frankly, there are going to be a lot of people that leave. And our community is never going to be the same again. Um, whether it takes us five years or 10 years or 15 years to quote unquote recover from this, our community will not look the same after this. Well, I really thank you for sharing that and being completely honest with, you know, the situation, your thoughts and how it's impacting not only ranches, but communities in general, because that is something to take into consideration that maybe oftentimes gets forgotten. So with that, mm -hmm. you know, what is your request for the listeners out there, for the people hearing this story? Um, would you have a request for them, whether that's sharing your story, the stories of others? Are there, is there a place where they can make donations? Like what would be your request? Really, my voice is just one voice. Um, you know, my story in this is not unique. And, and I hope that I have communicated that kind of across the board when trying to bring light to the situation. There are 26,000 families, households that are currently displaced due to these fires. We're just one family. And frankly, we came out very blessed in the end of it. Um, it's not over, but at the end of the day, we do ha eventually have a home to go home to. There are a lot of families that don't. Um, that being said, I think the honest intention of what I'm trying to do by bringing attention and awareness to this is there has to be some level of accountability. There, there has to be some level of accountability within the Forest Service, within the federal government, that this was not started by a lightning strike. This was not started by someone throwing a cigarette butt out the window on a bad day. This was a green stamp of approval prescribed burn that was lost control of. I don't think the accountability comes from the fire crews who lit it. They were following instructions. Someone somewhere said it's okay. Despite the conditions, despite possible pushback from those on the ground crews, someone said go ahead and light it. And here we are, 300,000 acres later, 26,000 families displaced. There needs to be some form of accountability. And unfortunately, I think bad press is the only way to get that. All right. Well, thank you for being on the show today and sharing your story. If you have anything else to add, you're welcome to. But if not, thank you again. Yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to just highlight this issue and moving forward, just pray for rain.